Okay, as we start talking about the respiratory system, I would encourage you to take a moment and uh, take a look at your old anatomy and physiology notes. Look at the parts of the respiratory system. Um, basically, we start from the nose downward, um, uh, nose and mouth into the, the pharynx, um, uh, the back of the pharynx. Um, there is the epiglottis, epiglottis to the trachea, trachea to bronchi, um, and then <clears throat> bronchi to bronchioles, um, and then on into the alveoli. Uh, so for the most part, you can take the, the respiratory system and basically divide it to everything um, above the uh, uh, trachea and everything below the bronchi and kind of have an upper and lower respiratory uh, tract system. We're going to look at the tr tr uh, drugs for upper respiratory disorders. Um, one of the interesting things about um, uh, upper respiratory disorders is that they're probably one of the most common diseases that we all suffer from and for the most part upper rep respiratory disorders are uh, caused by viral infections. They're a very short period of time. They can make you absolutely miserable but again for the most part uh, respiratory tract infections we don't have a lot of things we can do to cure. We mostly are going to be dealing with symptoms. Um, again the nice thing about the upper respiratory tract infections is they're transient. They'll go away and if you just put up with the symptoms you'll usually be fine. Um, generally, uh, upper respiratory tract disorders, usually we're talking about common cold, the non-medications uh, or the, the nursing interventions, the, the non-pharmaceutical interventions we could try include chicken soup, and again there is evidence for chicken soup as being uh, something that will help to reduce the length of um, uh, the common cold. We also recommend um, zinc lozenges. Zinc lozenges have evidence that they can be effective. Um, there's a variety of products like Zycam that people find to be effective, vitamin C people find to be effective. Notice I'm saying that people find to be uh, them effective. Uh, when they actually do clinical studies, there's not a whole lot of evidence to support them. But the beautiful full thing um, about upper respiratory infections is they're going to be transient. And if you do something that makes you feel like you're getting better, that's always a good thing. So a lot of people will take other products. Again, I recommend the honey, uh, chicken soup, flu lots of fluids, um, you know, make sure uh, lots of citrus can be helpful, just make sure you have sufficient vitamin C, take your vitamins, but uh, generally it's just a matter of waiting it out. So let's go ahead and talk about the common upper respiratory in infections. So common cold um, uh, usually involves na uh, nasal de uh, congestion. Um, some of that nasal congestion will drain into the back of throat, the throat, so, so people will um, uh, people will have sometimes sore throat associated uh, rhinitis, um, again is inflammation of the uh, nasal mucous membranes, sinusitis, um, again from your anatomy class you saw the, the small passages of the sinuses, uh, sinus and when they get inflamed can be very very uncomfortable cause of your headaches as well, acute pharyngitis is inflammation of the throat, um, again 70% of the time upper respiratory infections like these are caused by viruses and the antivirals that we have really don't treat these. And so what we're going to do for the most part with these conditions is we're mostly going to just treat the symptoms. Um, again, these are usually uh, uh, contagious for a short period of time. Uh, they're usually contagious before the onset of symptoms, but it's important uh, to talk about hygiene with your patients. Um, again, uh, you know, make sure that when they use tissues that they put them away where they won't be contaminating other, other people. For your purposes, recognize that your upper respiratory tract infection, which is just is just uncomfortable and isn't going to really cause a problem. With some of your patients who have decreased immune system can cause a pretty severe disease. So you've learned to cough into your elbow um, or sneeze into your elbow if possible. You know to wash your hands frequently. If you have a cold, make sure you do everything that you can to prevent transmission to others. Again, t transmission can be done, can occur from touching contaminated surfaces. Um, and again, um, you know, the, the big things that we think about are the secretions associated with the cold. Uh, the, you want to make sure that you control the secretions, you don't share them with, with others. So let's start off with the drugs that we use to treat the symptoms. And the first one is the antihistamines. And these are histamine type 1 receptor blockers. Uh, we, I'm going to divide them into first generation and second generation. And there's more first generations than just good old-fashioned Benadryl, which is diphenhydramine. 
Uh, Benadryl diphenhydramine, that's one that I definitely want you to know both brand and generic on. And I might ask you one or the other, um, just uh, make sure that you're familiar with those two names. Um, that's probably true with the second generations as well. Make sure that you're comfortable with the, the brand and generic name, because I'll use the, the different names interchangeably. Um, one of the other things with the antihistamines, uh, it's important to know the generic name. Um, for your purposes, uh, the antihistamines are incredibly effective for a whole host of diseases. Uh, we're going to talk about them right now for upper respiratory infections, but uh, it's the middle of the summer right now. A bunch of you are going to get poison ivy or, or bee stings or other rashes, and these very same drugs that, that help us with our upper respiratory infections can really help with the itching of those, ver those rashes. Um, so uh, you, you yourself might be going out to get these products. Uh, I always mention to folks that the generic versions of these drugs are all available, and the generic versions work as well as the brand name, um, and so you can save yourself a significant amount of money by going for generic on these, um, on these antihistamines. So again, the first generations are, is Benadryl, the second generation Zyrtec, Claritin, and Allegra. And these are called the non-sedating antihistamines. Um, they have less sedating effect. The, the difference between the two is the Benadryl is more hydrophobic or lipophilic and can actually make it into uh, the brain and have sedating effects, uh, act on the H1 receptors in the brain. The second generation antihistamines are more hydrophobic, I'm sorry, hydrophilic, and so they don't tend to pass into pass the blood-brain barrier and have less sedating effects. It's worth noting that there are paradoxical effects with both of these classes of drugs. So there are some people who, when they take Benadryl, actually get wired up on it. And there are some folks, in spite of the fact that I'm telling you that they're non-sedating, there are some uh, folks who, who experience sedation with the various second-generation antihistamines. When I look at the different second-generation antihistamines, what I'll tell you is that they, they all of them will work. Uh, some people have better experiences with one or the other. Uh, if you've tried one second generation antihistamine and it doesn't work for you, I actually encourage you to try the others. P people find that they find one that works the best for them and then they'll usually stick with that antihistamine. So again, uh, diphenhydramine is the first generation. The key thing that you'll want to know is uh, that it is a sedating or has some sedating effects. Um, we use it uh, as to, to, to treat um, acute and allergic rhinitis. Because it's a histamine blocker, it reduces secretions, so that can help with coughing. Um, you have to be careful with it uh, in folks because it has uh, it's a it has cholinergic or anticholinergic effects. Um, you have to be careful with it in people who have uh, liver disease, narrow angle glaucoma, and urinary retention. Um, again, you can be taken oral IM or IV. Uh, again, that drying of secretions. Uh, Reordinary retention, constipation, um, uh, those are side effects, but potential side effects. Uh, again, uh, when you're working with people uh, giving Benadryl, make sure you focus on the nursing interventions. Uh, if you're taking something that's sedating and then you also add alcohol to it, it can increase the effects of alcohol. And then just giving them lots of water or candy or gum to reduce dry mouth, dry mouth can be helpful. Um, so again, the second generations reduce sedation, have fewer anticholinergic effects. Um, they can be taken with alcohol. This is one of those, uh, whenever I'm at a, a, a summertime party, people are always asking me, well, I just took a, a, a uh, Zyrtec, can I, can I have a drink? And the answer is, well, I shouldn't recommend it because I'm the pharmacist, but it probably won't have a, a, a negative effect. Um, so, uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is nasal congestion, which is one of the classic symptoms of upper respiratory infections. And then we'll talk about nasal de decongestants. What they do is they hit alpha, uh, alpha adrenergic receptors. Um, they, that means that they cause vasoconstriction. They shrink nasal mucous membranes. And they also can help to reduce uh, the secretions. Um, here's, a, again, a list of nasal de decongestants. Afrin is a, a spray. Um, the Alarest uh, or Sudafed are, are common nasal decongestants. Um, again, they come in a variety of forms. Um, one of the interactions that's really key to note is the Sudafed. It can decrease the effect of beta blockers. It can decrease the effect 
uh, of other hypertension medicines. So we, do, we don't give Sudafed to patients with hypertension. Um, and again, it can also cause restlessness, uh, heart palpitations, or tachycardia. Um, and it can, should it be avoided, caffeine should be avoided with it. Afrin, um, Alarest, uh, Sudafed, um, uh, or other um, nasal decongestants. Um, again, same kind of side effects. Uh, really important to talk about, these are nasal decongestant, or talk about Afrin as a nasal decongestant spray. Um, one of the things that we find is that with Afrin, uh, it can help your symptoms for up to five days, but after five days, people who take Afrin will find that when they don't take it, they actually experience what we call re rebound decongestion. Um, so at, we recommend Afrin for less than five days. It's a key uh, consultation point. Afrin should, or nasal sprays, nasal decongestants should only be taken for five days or less because of the risk of rebound uh, congestion. And people will actually get addicted to uh, the nasal sprays. Um, there's a variety now of new um, intranasal glucocorticoids, and these are nasal sprays that have their, as their main ingredient a steroid. Um, these, they have an anti-inflammatory reaction, especially with people with allergies. This can be incredibly effective if, you're, if you have allergies and you haven't been able to handle your allergies. Um, uh, we are strongly, you know, uh, we can give people these medicines and they can be able to finally breathe or go outside for the first time in years uh, during the summertime. So they're really, really effective. Um, again, we'll, later on we'll talk more, in, in the next chapter we'll talk more about the problems that are associated with steroids. So, um, but again, uh, these should only be used when it's necessary. Okay, antitussives or, anti or cough medicines. So there's two ingredients in cheritussin, which are both good antitussives, uh, guafenicin uh, and codeine. Uh, again, codeine is a really effective antitussive. Codeine is actually um, a pro-drug. What happens when you take codeine is that if you have enzymes in your liver to metabolize it, your liver will convert codeine actually into morphine. So uh, codeine has both uh, antitussive effects, so it kind of calms your breathing, reduces the coughing, um, and it also uh, can help reduce pain. But it's important to recognize that uh, somewhere between 8 and 14 percent of Caucasians actually uh, lack the enzyme to metabolize codeine so they don't convert the product drug into the active drug. For those people, what happens is the codeine levels can actually build up and cause nausea. So, um, you know, you need to be a little bit careful if someone says, well, whenever I take cheritussin, I, I get really bad nausea. You know, not at first, but it builds up over time. What's happening is they're not metabolizing the drug and it's building up in their body. And, and those people shouldn't get codeine. We just stick with uh, guafenicin uh, with them. Um, again, guafenicin is the active ingredient in robitussin, can help reduce uh, uh, bronchial secretions. Um, we, it, it does have the side effects of drowsiness and nausea, um, and so you have to be careful, with, especially in elderly patients, again, be careful with uh, any kind of risk of falls. Okay, let's talk about sinusitis and acute pharyngitis. So sinusitis um, is a, a problem, uh, and you'll hear about people who say they have sinus infections and they just couldn't get rid of them in spite of getting antibiotics because uh, the sinuses, uh, you've seen them, the, the sinuses in the uh, skull when you had a chance to do your brain dissections uh, or your skull dissections back in anatomy and physiology. Uh, the sinuses are just really tight pockets that when they get inflamed, the exits and entrances um, become blocked and it becomes very difficult to get drugs in to actually treat the infections. So we often treat with decongestants, Tylenol, fluids, rest, and antibiotics. Um, lately I've seen added to this, um, uh, we'll also see um, doctors add steroids to the treatment because by adding steroids, because what happens is we give people antibiotics, if the antibiotics can't make their way into the passageways, they aren't very effective, so adding steroids can help to make the allow the antibiotics to make their way into the, the sinuses if you have an acute or if you have a, a chronic sinus infection. Pharyngitis is a sore throat. Um, again, salt lozenges, um, sorry, salt uh, gargles are, are highly recommended. No one does them. Um, uh, increased fluid intake is recommended. Uh, Tylenol um, um, antibiotics uh, are recommended with bacterial infections. 
but it's really key to recognize that most sore throats are not bacterial. On the other hand, the most severe of the bacterial infections is uh, a, a streptococcal infection strep uh, of the, the throat, and those people do need to be treated with antibiotics. Sort of the classic way to, to separate strep throat from other sore throat infections the step, strep throat almost always has a fever and has less nasal congestion symptoms. If a cold or a, a sore throat starts with nasal congestion, you're probably better off treating with antihistamines and decongestants uh, rather than treating with antibiotics uh, in order to get rid of the sore throat infections. Um, uh, again, one thing I would just want to add for uh, acute pharyngitis um, is that the recommended uh, drug for that is actually going to be, or if they take an antibiotic, is going to be amoxicillin. That's usually our first drug, our first drug for patients who have uh, sore throats or bacterial sore throats, upper respiratory infections. Thank you.